Dr. Uh, George Nortov, who is a philosopher, neuroscientist, and also also psychiatrist in the uh, um, uh, University of Ottawa in Canada. And Dr. Nortov is also an author of various books, including Neurowaves, Brain, Time and Consciousness, and other books. So enjoy. Thank you very much. <coughs> I'm always happy to be here in Armenia, and thanks for this one. I talk, about, talk to you about consciousness and of course everybody knows what is consciousness uh, but if I were asking you what consciousness is you would probably stumble and that's basically the state of the art also in current philosophy and neuroscience so there's a lot of debate and there's some mysteries and I want to uh, show you three key mysteries about consciousness that block and our presuppositions that sort of block our view on it so sometimes you don't see things because you look into the wrong direction. And I think that's exactly the state of art with consciousness. So let me start with the, somebody wants to be admitted. Um, so how does this, can I go to the next? Maybe it works here. No? Okay. So the first mystery. Nowadays, in the age of neuroscience, we of course think, Consciousness is inside the head. And maybe some of you are engineers, they think, oh, maybe consciousness is inside my artificial agents. There's a lot of discussion about that these days, as you know about artificial intelligence and consciousness. I will come back to that. So we think that consciousness, where we perceive ourselves as part of the world, is inside our brain. And <coughs> that's the first mystery. So it's inside here, it's not in our relation to the world or outside in the world itself. So let me see, can I do the next one? Yeah, the second mystery goes back to philosophy. I will come back to that towards the end of my talk, that we often assume that mental states or consciousness states are something special. Because if you have a feeling of boredom, I've oh got another one of those guys talking about consciousness here, that feeling of boredom, I cannot observe it from the outside. I can observe your smile, but I cannot observe your feeling. And that has led to the assumption, consciousness is something special. So now I have to stay here a little bit for the photo. <laughs> and now for the next one. Oop. Third mystery. That has led to the assumption that consciousness is something special and different from anything else in the brain in the physical world. So that has led to the assumption of a mind. And that the mind is different from the body and nowadays for the brain. And I will tell you later towards the end of my talk that we still search for the mind but in forms of special features in the brain itself. So my talk we basically try to address these three mysteries by providing you a lot, some insight from neuroscience, also from people who lose consciousness. And basically, the main assumption is consciousness is not inside the head. It's also not just outside in the world. It links the inside and outside. The second assumption, remember, that consciousness or conscious content are mental, some special mental features. I will discard with that and say consciousness is temporal. And I will show you a lot of interesting data. Even your thoughts, where you think they are mental, they are temporal. I will demonstrate that. The third one, that consciousness, as I said, has always been assumed to be something special. And I will say, no, it's nothing special. Just look in the natural world and you see a lot of similar features, phenomena. And then at the end, I will try to, to give a little bit of outlook for my view on artificial intelligence and artificial agents with respect to consciousness. So let me start with the first view. Consciousness, I already showed that. Consciousness is inside your head rather than outside in the world. Now I will show you various data that undermine that assumption. So, when you look into the outside world, I uh, think if you are engineers, uh, you will see a lot of 
what is called dynamic phenomena. You go to the seaside, you go to the Black Sea, to the Caspian Sea, uh, to the Mediterranean, you see a lot of waves, you see small waves, big waves, and you all know that the big waves have a lot of power and the small waves have not enough power. The longer waves, the big waves have a longer duration, and if you happen to be a surfer, you know the dynamics of the waves very well, because you need to uh, adapt to the dynamics of the waves to get the groove of the surfing. And uh, seismic earth waves, they happen on a much longer scale. You might have heard about the earthquake in Taiwan just yesterday, and there are different kinds of waves, very slow waves, very fast waves. And despite the differences, they share that you can have sort of have a certain time series of changes, fluctuation, change. And basically, if you want to have the main message of my talk, uh, it's basically that consciousness is about change. Change is described as a pattern of change, a certain pattern, and that's what consciousness is about. So now, if you want to go home, you can go home now. So, and you will see that will basically uh, so now the question is, if you have continuous changes, unfortunately I'm not allowed to move here to the other end, so you have continuous changes. If you follow my talk, for instance here, my hand movements, how does your brain process that? And the brain is really an ingenious organ. The more I research on it, the more I become aware of that. It's absolutely amazing. And this is one of the most amazing features, how adaptive your brain is. So your brain has continuous ongoing fluctuation, even if you don't do anything. If you just mind wander or just walking around or you sleep, your brain is continuously active. So I often compared that in my earlier talks to, let's say, you go out there, you try to pick up your car, but your car is not standing still, it's moving back and forth in different trajectories. That's what your brain is. Yeah? So the brain has an inner time, it's continuously changing, and an inner pattern, and that is basically here the time series, dynamics, pattern of change, and you see this is in different frequencies. For the expert, you have different frequencies here, delta, theta, uh, doesn't matter, it's from 1 hertz to uh, 80 hertz uh, for the expert, and, but it's also even slower frequencies in, let's say, 100 second 0.01 hertz. So this is important. The brain has basically, as I say in my book here, has different waves, so basically like the sea set. It has very big waves, powerful, very small waves, fast and less powerful. So now the question is, and neuroscience really uh, doesn't know that, what do these waves do? Why is this brain continuously, spontaneously active? And this is uh, probably so now here, and you can measure that, uh, for instance here, with the uh, frequencies of the brain, it's what you call a power spectrum. Here you have the frequency, uh, this is slower frequency, faster frequency, this is power, this is more power, less power, and you see a typical pattern that in your slower frequencies you have much more power than in the faster frequency. Now again, go to the seaside, look at the seismic earth waves, you see exactly the same pattern for the expert um, among you. This is called scale-free dynamics, which is ubiquitous in nature. And you will see that is key for consciousness later. So now the question, but what does the brain do with all these different frequencies and waves? Why is the brain continuously active uh, and why does it do this? And that's the next one of the next things. So for instance, I told you our environment is continuously changing. So I do these movements. I move fast, I move very slow. And I can predict that your brain, if I do this continuously, you don't want me to do this for one hour, then you're bored, uh, that your brain will process the frequency of these movements. Now, if I move a little faster, your brain will again process these frequencies. So here, we tested that. So here, we did a uh, functional magnetic resonance imaging, basically where you can scan the whole brain, fMRI, and <clears throat> we presented a short auditory stimulus every 52 to 60 seconds. So it's extremely sparse design. Stimulus, and then basically almost a minute waiting, next stimulus. And in between, nothing. So in that corresponds, unfortunately, it's 
cannot be seen here, it corresponds to a frequency range of 0.016 to 0.019 hertz. So you can recalculate this 52 to 60 seconds into a frequency range. So now what we see in the brain, so people were in the scanner, got the stimuli, we see that in exactly this frequency range where the stimuli were presented, you see an increase in the power spectrum. So again, if I do one hertz movement, your brain, if I do this over the next five minutes, your brain probably will show an increase in the power at exactly one hertz. So then we said, oh, maybe it's just an artifact. So then we also looked in the resting state without any stimuli. And you don't see this peak in the power spectrum. So it's really basically the periodicity of the task of the stimuli is processed and encoded by your brain in its own frequencies, in its own waves. It's quite amazing. That's why I can say if I do these kind of... So here I show you another example of that, and I think this is one of the really... Okay, let me try this one. Doesn't want to go away. Can we do it there? Can Next slide. Ah, ah, yes, good idea, Steve. Yeah, good idea. Not a good idea, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, finally. Okay, um, but there was another one. Okay, this goes back. No, 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 she's doing it. Yeah. Are you doing it? Yeah. <laughs> oh. Too many cooks spoil the slides, yeah. <laughs> Not the meal. Okay, so yeah, perfect. Thanks so much. Um, so here we did another thing. So here we presented stimuli for 25 seconds. Faces, emotional faces for 25 seconds, and then 25 seconds, nothing. So that amounts to a frequency of 0 .0, uh, 20 seconds, 0 0.025 hertz. And what did we see? So there's one region in the brain which is called the fusiform face area, which is specialized for faces. It's amazing. So when you see me, that region will become active. I hope so. Yeah? And look what the fusiform face area does. It shows an increase in exactly that frequency range where the stimuli are presented. Yeah? And this is every 20 seconds. Yeah? So it's really amazing. Your brain keeps a score. It tracks the frequency of the outside stimuli. And this sounds trivial, but it's not. Because that's exactly the difference to current artificial intelligence. They do not track the frequency and the temporal structure of the uh, stimuli, the external environment, and that's why they cannot adapt as well. Yeah. <coughs> so I will come back. So you, you see this. It's quite amazing here. This is a resting state. No such peak in the task. Yeah, resting state. They don't see any phases. Here they see phases, 20 second blocks. And you see this. So now, next one. Or shall I do it? Child. You will. Okay, perfect. So now, <coughs> how is that related to consciousness? So I often try to say that consciousness <coughs> is about that you experience yourself as part of the wider world. You can make a difference between yourself and the rest of the world, but at the same time, you experience yourself as part of this room. And if this room would be different, which a much higher ceiling and much bigger uh, and thousand seats and uh, you would feel and experience yourself in a very different way. Yeah? Because the room in which you're situated is very different. And that affects your consciousness. So consciousness cannot be inside the head. So here, that's why we tested this. So here we had people first in the awake state and then in the anesthetic state. And here, this was yet another study. So <coughs> here, we again, every 20, uh, 25 seconds, you see here, this is the uh, frequency in which the stimuli were presented, and you see the increase in the awake state. Now, same subjects go into an anesthetic state, lose their consciousness, and that's what you see. Yeah? Completely flat. And also, for the experts among you, the engineers or physicists or others, uh, you see the typical scale-free activity here, more power in the slower frequencies, less power in the faster frequencies, and you see it's completely flat here. 
This is basically what you call, whoops, white noise, this one. Not, yeah, this is also noise, slight noise. Uh, so here, this is basically white noise because it's completely flat. Hello, he's from Taiwan. Yeah, and in the awake state, you have pink noise or scale-free dynamics, whereas it's completely lost in the anesthetic state. Yeah, you can see this here look completely flat. So that basically means you encounter the seaside, it's completely flat, no waves at all. Yeah, and that's probably exactly what you experience or non-experience when you're unconscious. Everything is the same, completely undifferentiated, meaning you don't experience anything at all when you lose consciousness. So, I do the next one? Yes. Okay, I'm thanks. Sorry. I, I kind of missed the part where uh, you talked about different colors. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Different colors are one. Mm -hmm. Ah, so sorry. So, okay, sorry. Okay, this is a single subject. Each line is one single subject. Single what? Single subject. One subject, sorry, I forgot to mention that. So each line is one single subject. Yeah, and you see it's really consistent. All subjects are completely flat. And here you see this, almost all subject, but you see a huge inter-individual variability here, how the brain adapts to the frequency of the environment. So this is something we always see. So when I do this, this movement, I'm sure that we have basically, I don't know how many people are here in the room, 60, 70 different power spectra. The peak, slightly different. You all show some activity in this frequency, but slightly different. Yeah? Because your re brain reacts in a different way. Okay. I can do the next one. Okay. Not that the screen becomes unconscious. Yeah? <laughs> so, so, so here, and you already see that your brain has different kinds of frequencies. Later I use the term time scales. I will explain them. Yeah? Uh, as I said, you go to the seaside, you see all kinds of waves, fast, slow, at different frequencies. Same in the brain. And the question is, and this is, so this is, uh, that basically your different frequencies are used to track different time scales in your environment. So here, uh, the very short time scale, just the kayak guy. So this is fast, it goes very fast, so your brain also uses its own fast frequencies to track this one. But then there is sort of longer time scale, slower frequencies. You see here the water, uh, the waves of the water. So the brain also uses slightly slower frequencies for that. Yeah? And then very slow frequencies in the background, it uses its own frequencies. So you see now you see, get an idea that probably the brain uses its own inner time scales and frequency to track corresponding time scales and frequencies. And when you would decompose, even my behavior here over time, let's say you, you have come some kinematic measures here on me and you uh, later uh, do a fast Fourier transform and make a power spectrum of all my movements, you will see quite a variety of time scales and frequencies I'm using. And that's really amazing. Yeah? And you will see that the more frequencies the brain itself has, the better the brain can track uh, the environment. And that makes your consciousness. So your consciousness is basically multi-layered, yeah, of a foreground layer, intermediate layer, background layer, and these are different time scales, yeah? So it's multiple layers uh, of different times, and that's actually also what you experience. You do not just experience me, uh, my face. You experience my face, my body. You experience I'm s uh, standing here in front of the table. You experience the whole room. So it's a foreground, background with multiple layers in your consciousness, yeah? So, um, so now I need to do this. Also, I need to do this. You will push the right button for me. Sometimes the brain is easier than all this technical stuff. So now the questions. How do you experience this sort of tracking of the environmental frequencies by the brain? Uh, so what do you experience? Now, imagine uh, we would play music here, very rhythmic music. Um, I don't detail because all your musical tastes will be different. But let's say it's very rhythmic and you really go with the melody, with the tune and the rhythm of the music and you feel a certain synchrony and groove. Yeah? And you feel good about it. Yeah? So that's basically synchrony. So here, 
we indeed, just on the psychological level, we is a large-scale study with 1,000 subjects, and we tested, we asked subjects uh, how much they feel in synchrony with their own self, with the body, with the environment, and with the other. So it was pure psychological investigation. And you can see, indeed, that that is here, and we had also other questions about your thought on the past, thought present, thought on future, and others. And this is basically a network model. And you can see that this is really the core, the synchrony with your own self, other, and environment. And you can also see, we did this also before and after COVID. And the same subject before and after COVID. And you can see that after COVID, they felt significantly lower synchrony with their own self, synchrony of other, synchrony with nature, environment, and body. And that was also related, which I don't show here, to higher incidences of anxiety and depression. So you need to be aligned to your environmental context through your brain frequencies and time scale. That makes you feel good. It's like when you uh, tap, you probably can't see it because the table is in front of you, tap to the rhythm of the music. Yeah? And if you can synchronize with my movements here, then you feel connected and you might decipher the meaning of what I try to convey. Uh, and then you understand and hope it makes you feel good. So it's really uh, a key feature. And that, let me try. Ah, maybe I need to do this here. No? OK. Yeah, so that leads me basically to the first conclusion. Um, consciousness is neither inside the head nor outside in the world. But it relates the inside and the outside. Yeah? And we call this <coughs> uh, temple spatial alignment. You're aligned to your environment sort of in a temple way. It's, of course, virtual. You, you can't uh, uh, grasp it and observe it like that. But this is always there. And your brain am amazingly tracks all this. So we have many more data on how the brain tracks the uh, uh, temple structure of your outer environmental context. And that's really a key. So that means that consciousness is not inside your head. It's really neuroecological or relational, as I like to say. Yeah? So relating to the outside of the, uh, the outside world through adapting the dynamics of the brain's inside. And that is really a remarkable feature of the brain. I cannot overemphasize that. That distinguishes the brain from artificial agents. And you mentioned that I'm also a psychiatrist. This is the key problem in psychiatric disorders, like depression or schizophrenia, where you have changes in this temporal spatial alignment. So it's a very basic dimension. And usually, we are not aware of this. Yeah? We, are, we don't perceive how our frequencies uh, track the frequencies of the environment. Your brain does the job. It's automatic, autopilot. It's an amazing, amazing feature. I can only, as I said, I cannot overemphasize it. So, so now let me go to the next one about conscious content. Usually, as I said, the mystery is that conscious contents are mental. They especially here mental features in your brain, and that has been assumed that goes philosophy back. And the mark of the mental, uh, what is here, everything that is mental is conscious, So, rather than physical. So now I show you that that is not the case. And I give you the example of thoughts. So the question is, how can you measure thoughts? So you can measure, you can ask subjects. For instance, you can ask the subjects whether their thoughts are about the, the task, for instance, about the talk, or whether you mind wander and have some different thoughts. Oh, God, does this not have stopped soon, hopefully, and then I can have a nice, good Armenian dinner, which, by the way, I really appreciate your food. Uh, so that basically then you call that off thought. Yeah? Yeah? And then you can also say, OK, I have only one content. I'm really focusing on Nordhoff and his consciousness stuff. And that's all I'm thinking now. However, you might also think, oh, your mind is wandering, oh, the dinner, and then I see my girlfriend or my boyfriend, and tomorrow uh, I go here and there. So you have multiple thoughts, a chain of thoughts, different thoughts. And you can ask the subjects whether that thoughts are multiple contents or single contents. And that's what we did in this study. And at the same time, we measured the brain activity, the electrical activity, with electroencephalography, EEG. 
And in EEG, <coughs> there's a special measure where you can basically see how the frequencies of the brain change. Yeah? Whether they're high or low, and at each time point, how your frequencies change, you will see the uh, slide uh, results in the next slide, which is called frequency sliding. Yeah? So, and with that, we try to track your thoughts, whether they're on or off, whether they're about the talk here, the consciousness, or you're somewhere else, and whether you have multiple or just single thought content. So, this is a difficult uh, 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 slide, I know, but what we basically can see, <coughs> we can really see that, uh, let me explain you this one. So this is about, the, uh, for the expert, is the alpha frequency is the faster frequency between 8 and 12 hertz. Uh, and you can see that uh, here the um, yellow line is basically your on thoughts and your single thought. Yeah, that's the brown line, or yellow, whatever you call it. And the blue line is the off thoughts uh, and the multiple thoughts. We group them together. I'm sorry, yeah. Can you, can you please uh, define what is thought in terms of biology? I'm just doing that. Yeah. Just give me a second and then I come. Yeah. Um, so here you can see uh, the yellow or the brown line are the on and single thoughts, and the blue are the multiple and of thoughts. So these are the blue lines, are the thoughts where you wonder, you're not interested in the talk, your thoughts wander somewhere else. Here, the yellow line is basically you really focus on trying to understand me. And you see that in the faster frequencies, here you see much higher frequencies. Uh, this is basically the uh, movements, the changes in the frequencies over time. You can really see that the on thoughts, the single, the task focused thoughts, uh, show higher peak frequency here. Than in the, in the faster frequency than the thoughts when you're off. Now, when you wander your thoughts, you will go into a slower frequency range, theta, 5 to 8 hertz, and you see now the opposite pattern. Now the blue line shows higher frequencies in the slow one than the uh, yellow line slash brown line or the uh, off, the, the on thought. So basically what you see, to cut it short, you see that different kinds of thought on task or off thoughts are mediated by slower or faster frequencies. When I talk about slower or faster frequencies, we talk about frequencies of the brain? Yeah. We are talking about frequencies of the brain measured with the EEG. So this is neuronal data, electrical activity in the brain, your different frequencies in the brain, how they track your different kinds of thoughts. So Correct. And how do you call the faster frequencies? Well, that, of course, is a question for the hen and the egg, which I cannot uh, answer here. But this is all that you basically have when you have f uh, uh, more f task focused thoughts or single thought, you have faster frequencies. And I will come back later to the mechanism of that. Yeah, because. A rule of thumb, and the data shows this more and more, if you're more externally oriented and your on thoughts, when you focus on the talk here, uh, is more externally oriented, you're usually faster. When you're more internally oriented towards your own mind running, you're usually slower. And these results support that. There's various lines of evidence supporting that. It's an intrinsic organization of the brain. That is currently in work because we're doing, I don't know whether you engineer Granger causality between the time series of thought, time series of EEG. Yeah, um, it's, the results are clear. It's the brain spontaneously changing and that causes the thought. Yeah. Um, so this is basically, um, uh, it's the time from the onset. We also presented a stimulus, a simple stimulus here. Uh, and that's basically the onset of the stimulus. Yeah. Okay. Any more questions? Any more thoughts on the thought? More about thoughts will come. Uh, so you can see that. Uh, now let me go to the next one. So here we did exactly basically what he was a little bit asking for, but only on the psychological level. So here we tracked the changes in the subject thoughts over time. So basically we asked them, 
is your thought more internally oriented about your own self, or is yourself more externally oriented about your own environment? And subjects had to do this for half an hour, and we asked them every uh, 10 to 30 seconds, uh, asked the question, uh, how much did your thought change? Was it more internally or externally oriented? With exactly the de definition, uh, now when you think about consciousness and somebody giving a talk, your thought is more externally oriented, uh, but if you uh, think about, let's say, the dinner or whatever other things, um, uh, then it's probably more internally oriented. So and we looked basically, and what we constructed is a time series of thoughts. So we really wanted to investigate here thought dynamics. So and here and then we did <coughs> here and then we plotted that we did a we did a time series of thought changes, and we did also fast Fourier transformation, and basically developed a power spectrum of thought of thought change over time, uh, internal external thought change. So, and you can so for see here, you see a healthy subject, <coughs> uh, then we could calculate the frequency, the power uh, of the thought changes, and this is basically here the highest power peak here. Unfortunately, you can't see this is about 0.035, mm. and that also gives you how often the thought changes. Yeah, your thought, particularly the internal, and external, can last relatively long, 10 to 20 seconds. Yeah, but that is probably superseded by faster thoughts. So probably you have also different layers of thought according to the time scale. But that's a hypothesis. We're working on it. So uh, what you see here, you see a good power, uh, and you see changes, and you see frequencies. Now look, this was done also in seriously depressed patients. Patients suffer from major depressive disorder, seriously depressed. And you may know that these patients are not only depressed, but that they also show sort of ruminating thoughts, thoughts which are as you see in my hand movement, circulating. It's always the same and nothing changes. When you ask severe depressed patients, they tell you nothing changes and it drives them nuts. Yeah? So imagine that you have the feeling nothing changes. And that's literally also the state of your brain, also nothing changes. And you see this here, look at this power spectrum. There's no power. Yeah? They feel they have no energy. That's also what they often report. They have no power and you see very uh, slower frequency. They were also much slower in their frequency. You can see, read this in the paper. So that's why we coined the paper slow and powerless thought dynamics relates to the rumination and the brooding to the thoughts in depression. So you can also construct a time series of your psychological measures, which is really a new thing, and that is something we're doing more and more. So you investigate the dynamics of your thoughts and your psychological functions. So now here, show you a third example to make my point, uh, how temple features determine your thought. So this is a study on meditation. Um, so here uh, you have different forms of meditation. So here you have the shunya meditation where you don't focus on any specific object at all. So this is something we're doing with India. Um, so where you don't focus on any object at all, you just let them pass by. You not get involved, you don't attach, you don't focus on a particular thing. You just basically you just sit in front and the river flows and you don't care, just passing by. You don't get involved, you don't focus on anything particular. And you just let everything fly by. Then you have the other meditation, this is here, uh, 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 Supranya, uh, where you focus on specific body parts. So here your attention is really focused on specific objects. This is indicated here uh, uh, on specific objects like your different body parts. So now the idea, are the different numbers of the attended thoughts in these two meditation techniques related to different time scales or inner durations in the brain? As you said, everything is about frequencies. Frequencies is about duration. Let me drink a little bit in the meantime. Okay, can you push the button? Okay, so here, and you can measure that basically temple windows. It's basically do these two different forms of meditation have different kind of temple windows in the brain. So here again, we measured the electrical activity with EEG and we uh, calculated what is called an autocorrelation window autocorrelation function 
is basically your temple window. I will explain that in a couple of slides what exactly it is. But the main message is when you focus on specific objects, your temple window is much shorter because you focus on the specific object on your different body parts. Whereas if you don't focus on anything, you just let it pass by, your temple window becomes much longer. As I said, I will explain a little bit more about these temple windows in the following. So it's important that basically the kind of attention or to your own thoughts tested through these three different forms of meditation really are related to different temple window sizes in your brain. So that already tells you, and you see already where I'm going, that your mental contents are not mental, they are temporal. Yeah? You focus on completely different contents here. Uh, here basically you don't focus on any content, here you focus on the bodily contents, and you see that is related to different temple windows in your brain. So let me go to the next one. So now I come to one of the key terms. Um, one was frequencies, you already saw that, another one is time scales. What are time scales? Uh, time scales are intrinsic durations. Yeah? So for instance, you have geologic time scales. Yeah? So these are processes and the geologic time scales are extremely long. I don't need to, need to tell you, it's impressive. Look up in Google, uh, it's amazing. I, I cannot go into detail, but it's very long. Seismic earth waves have also relatively long time scales, longer than probably a whole person's life. So meaning the time scales we have in our brain are relatively short compared to many other processes in the world. Yeah? And the brain, this is indicated here, as I said, has also different time scales. Yeah? Different intrinsic durations of various processes. Yeah? Shorter, longer. And the interesting thing that in the sensory regions of your brain, like here your visual regions, here in the back, you have much shorter time scales than, for instance, here in your higher order regions, you might have heard the prefrontal cortex. Yeah? Here you process the external information, everything is changing fast, so you need short time scales to track that. And your inner inside of the brain, here the higher order regions, prefrontal regions, they're not as affected by all these external changes, so they can do whatever they want, so they're a little bit slower. They have longer time scales. Now, what do these time scales do and why they are important? I definitely cannot cope with the time scales of this one. <coughs> and that is shown, yeah. So here I give you the example of a window. So here, of course, we are in the spatial domain, but it will be the same for the temple domain. So look, this is a tree. Obviously, everybody knows this. However, if it were you were only showing this window, you wouldn't know whether it's a tree or not. You would say, yes, maybe it's a vase with some branches, or it's a bush. You have no idea. Yeah? If, I were only, if I were showing you only this one and maybe not this one, you might not see the lane. So you could, uh, the tree could be everywhere, but you don't know whether it's this kind of landscape in a forest. Yeah? So meaning, different window sizes, you see different things. Even the same thing, like here's a tree, appears very different in different window sizes. Now, imagine your brain is exactly that. It's a collection of different temple window sizes through which it tries to scan and address and uh, track the environment through these different window sizes. Yeah? So I see your face, probably a very smaller a temple window. Fortunately, you don't move. You move, so my window needs to be variable here. Yeah. And but then I have a longer, a longer window size when I probably scan the whole room here. Yeah, because that takes time, so I need a longer window to integrate all that. Yeah, that's an interesting um, uh, change. Yeah. So and that's exactly it. So your brain is basically what I present here is a spatial window, is basically a collection of different temple windows slash different time scales slash different durations. And that is huge consequence. I know this is a complex slide, but let me walk you through. So if you have collection of different time scales indicated here, very long ones, shorter ones, yeah? 
you can track all these environmental changes. Police running after thieves. Uh, uh, you need a long, you need shorter time scale to say, police stop, stop now, stop now. So you need a short time scale to pick up those words. However, you also want to link the police to the stop. That, you need a longer time scale for that. And then you also want to link this guy to this guy, you need a very long time scale for that. Remember, the different temple layers I presented you at the beginning, the background, foreground, same thing here. So your temple windows, the more temple windows you have, the better you can track the environment. So now, this is now data driven based on data we have. When you start sleeping or become drowsy, your temple windows measured by this autocorrelation function become slightly longer. So we would assume that then your perception becomes more blurry because you're missing the shorter time scale. You cannot distinguish between here, pulley, seize, stop, and so on. Yeah? Because it's just put together into one. Now, your time scales become even longer, second sleep stage, and you are sedated. Now I need to water a little bit. And your autocorrelation, your temporal windows in the brain, your time scales become even longer, and the shorter ones are missing even more. So it becomes more and more blurry. Now, when you're in deep anesthesia and prolonged disorders of consciousness, your time scales are extremely long, measured by the autocorrelation function, so you cannot integrate anything at all, it's completely dark. Yeah, there's no differentiation anymore. Yeah. These are, of course, assumptions. This is all based on data. Yeah? Unfortunately, you cannot ask unconscious patients what she or he experiences or perceives. But that's basically an inference from the time scale. So you see how the seemingly mental contents are, in truth, really temporal content, temporally shaped. So now here, I give you some more details. Let's say here is your external input. And this is the actual physical duration of your input. So I do this, I do longer input here. And this is the length of your brain, of your time scale in your brain. If it's sort of medium long, you might put these two inputs together into one. So you will not perceive a difference between these two finger movements. But you can distinguish this finger movement from my arm movement. Yeah? Because your temporal windows are short enough to do that. And you have two different forms of evoked activity in the brain. Now, if you have a very long temporal windows, you put everything together. So you cannot make a differentiation. Yeah? You put everything together. Yeah? Then you would not experience a difference between the different timings, the different events in your environmental context. And indeed, we have various papers, including brain imaging, as well as a lot of computational modeling, where we can really show this. Depends on the frequency range where you measure. So if you measure it in fMRI, you go from 100 seconds to one second uh, to 10 seconds. So it's in that range. Yeah. If you measure in EEG, it's on faster frequencies, uh, one hertz to 80 hertz. So it's relatively short. It's in the millisecond range. Really depends on your measure instrument. It's relative to that. Yeah. So. Conscious contents are not mental, but they're temporal. This is a very daring hypothesis because philosophers will not like this. But they're really temporal. We have a lot of more and more support is coming. I wouldn't have said this two years ago, but we have more and more support set. Because they're shaped by the intrinsic duration of the brain's time scales. And the better, the larger your repertoire of different time scales is. Yeah? You have faster, slower frequencies, longer, shorter temporal windows in your brain. The better, the more sophisticated, the more complex you can track your environmental context. Yeah? So that is really, so it's your range of your time scales. So it's a repertoire of different time scales, and that basically shapes your conscious content. And another thing which I do not report here, these time scales you have are probably also shaped by your environmental context. Yeah, so that's probably why we all are in a different environmental context. There are cultural differences, as we all know, and that's also why we perceive things in a slightly different way. So 
Now, let me come to the uh, third point, uh, which is more sort of on the theoretical side. Consciousness is non-special. So I think I already mentioned that consciousness is special. That's the assumption from anything else in both brain and physical world. So that's why uh, here you can see consciousness is special and everything else is distinguished from non-consciousness or unconscious, non-special. So and that goes philosophically when you go into Western philosophy. It goes back to René Descartes, uh, who assumed a mind as distinguished from the body and the brain. And he assumed that the mind must be special because, as I said initially, we cannot observe it, the mind like this book. Yeah? So I cannot observe your thoughts as such. Yeah? And you cannot observe them in that sense also. You can introspect, but there's a long discussion about that too. Uh, but that's basically it. So and now, of course, you say, no, 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 the uh, mind is... And interestingly, that specialness is still prevalent even in our time in neuroscience. So, of course, now we assume, yes, it's in the brain. Consciousness is related to the brain and not a separate mind anymore. However, then they assume, and many neuroscientific theories of consciousness assume, that um, uh, special neuronal features within the brain, special neuronal mechanism underlying consciousness as distinguished from all other mechanisms in the brain. So the substrate has changed from mind to brain. But the specialness, that consciousness is something special, is still preserved because they assume special neuronal mechanism only for consciousness. Yeah. So, and then, of course, you focus, that implies that you focus, okay, what is the difference between the non-conscious brain and the conscious brain? Yeah. So you focus on the differences. So you assume a special mechanism. I don't know, some of you might know the integrated information theory assumes, uh, IIT assumes integration, global neuronal workspace theory assumes uh, a global workspace, and so on. I could say the same for many other theories. So the specialness originally from philosophy is still preserved in current neuroscience. Always puts a smile on my face uh, as a philosopher. So then you might say, yeah, maybe we can also approach this in a different way by saying maybe we look for what is similar. What is similar between the brain and consciousness. And you already saw a lot of examples. You saw the temple dynamic, you saw the dynamic pattern, you saw the time scales, you, you, you saw the frequency tracking of the environment. Yeah? And all that is lost when you lose consciousness. So that's why I say maybe consciousness is nothing special. Uh, there is the same properties in the brain, temple dynamic features, which are also manifest on the mental level. And you saw, for instance, the thought dynamics. We have many more studies now where we really look for the dynamics of psychological features. And even more interesting, these dynamic features are not only in the brain and in the consciousness, but they're abundant in the world. Remember my example of seismic earth waves, like waves, geologic time scales. So here, that's why I go, that's why I always like to look, <coughs> go back to nature into the world. And there's a very nice quote by Nikola Tesla. You all probably know the Tesla cars. Um, and when you look on his Google website, you see why Elon Musk uh, named his cars Tesla. Because Nikola Tesla seemed to be as brilliant and as eccentric as Elon Musk. Yeah, so highly recommended. If you want to find the secrets, the secrets of the universe, think in terms of energy, frequency, and vibration. So as I said, we see the same dynamic phenomenon, maybe on slightly different time scales, but the same time scale. Here, sea waves, seismic earth waves, and this is explicated here. So they all, seismic earth waves, sea waves, brain, and I could enlarge this by many examples, they all have a pattern of change, a certain dynamics, a time series. The only difference whether they operate on slightly different time scales. Yeah? But the phenomena within the time scales are similar. And of course, certain frequencies from the sea wave our brain can capture. There's a certain overlap. Yeah? So that is quite, so in these, exactly these phenomena, different durations, but they all show 
uh, time series of the changes of fluctuations. So in exactly, and I showed you earlier, that exactly these phenomena are key for consciousness. So that's why we say time scales, inner durations, are shared by brain and consciousness. Remember my slides with the difference between brain and consciousness and now the similarity. That's why we like to speak of a common currency. Like when you go to the European Union, you literally have a common currency. It's the euro. Same here. What is a common currency between brain and mind or brain and consciousness is it's not the euro. Sorry, it's not the drum either. Uh, is dynamics. And interestingly, this is not just a common currency between brain and mind or consciousness, but between world brain and consciousness. Yeah? So that's why I like to speak of neural waves. So that's basically, and you see many of the studies I showed you and many others which you can see on our website uh, are really trying to show this uh, uh, temporal spatial features or the dynamics of brain and mind. So the third conclusion, consciousness is not special at all since time and its dynamics are shared by world, brain, and mind. So it's nothing special. Just look into nature and you will see abundant of ideas and examples where you can learn and how consciousness works. I have a question. Can I? Or is it Go ahead. Be careful. I did not say that consciousness is not important. I didn't say that. And I did not say that you cannot read it, because read you can also have verbally and non-verbally. And as a psychiatrist, I deal a lot with non-verbal interaction. So you can read the behavioral manifestation of some inner mental states, particularly because it is relational, because it is tracking the frequency. Yeah? So there are certain patterns in that. Again, so actually we're working on the emotion dynamics. Exactly that. Yeah? And different emotion. Maybe I finish the talk and then the questions, because, sorry, I didn't know that. Yeah? Okay. So, and the fourth part is shorter. So now what does this imply for uh, the agents and in general? So first we develop a temporal spatial theory of consciousness, different mechanism of consciousness, uh, later in 2017, other papers have since appeared. This is both neuroscientific, but also philosophical and ontological, which is in different books. So now, that leads me to a really a different form of neuroscience. You have heard a lot about cognitive psychology, cognitive neuroscience, affective neuroscience, and uh, different forms of neuroscience, which are all here. Same. However, that just captures the other part of the iceberg. That's what is visible. You need to go deeper. That's where the interesting things happen. And as you know, if you go to the bottom, the bottom of the iceberg, right in the water, is the basis and fundament. If there are major changes here, everything will change here. So, and that's exactly so. We need to go deeper, and that's where brain dynamics operates. That's what I showed you. And it's not trivial because it's not a random process. Yeah, there's a certain structure. And that structure, that's why we, I like to work with engineers, we really go uh, into that uh, structure, different measures for that structure, like scale-free activity, autocorrelation function, and so forth. That's what we call spatial temporal neuroscience. And that shapes these kind of different functions, including the emotions. So, and this is the moment where mental features come. This is that level. Uh, consciousness, we also develop the same for self. Uh, you saw the data on the mind wandering, and we also developed a whole spatial temple psychi psychiatry for novel diagnostic and also therapeutic tools for therapy of these, and diagnosis and therapy of these uh, disorders, like depression, schizophrenia, anxiety. So this is what we call, and you see here, brain dynamics at the bottom, brain function as well. And if you want to extend this, you would need to put in the world here. So, uh, that basically, why are the uh, brain's time scales so relevant for consciousness. This is basically already uh, clear here. It's your continuous matching and tracking of your environmental input. And why is that important for consciousness? Because by that you become part of the world and that's what you experience in consciousness. Yeah? You've, uh, you consciously sort of implicitly or explicitly aware of this room as your background and so on and so forth. Yeah? So it's a continuous 
tracking, matching between environmental dynamics and your brain dynamics. And that's key for your consciousness. Without that, you lose consciousness. If that changes in abnormal ways, you have mental disorder. So now, what does this imply for artificial intelligence or artificial agents? So my claim is here, when you look into the uh, design of these guys, they have a lot of cognitive activity, and they're certainly better in this part than we are. Chess playing, go, I don't need to tell you all of that. But they're extremely bad in this part, in the adaptation, in the alignment. Why? Because they lack these different time scales, as far as I can see. So let's say, if you play music, classical music, you have different time scales, fast, short, at the same time, uh, uh, over the time of the music. So now, if you have only the faster time scales, the shorter time scales, but not the slower one, you will always dance too fast, or the robot will dance too fast. Now, if your robot has only shorter time scale, uh, longer time scales, it will always dance too slow. And tragically, this is exactly what you, for instance, see in certain mental disorders. This is what you see in depression. The people really lag behind because their brain is too slow, literally. We can measure that. And in mania, when you're too happy, uh, uh, for the psychiatrist, nothing is good. When you're too happy, you get into psychiatrists. When you're depressed, you get into psychiatry. Um, uh, uh, you dance too fast. Yeah? So for the manic patient, we are too slow. Yeah? Because th her or his time scales are faster yeah? relative to the environmental con. So, so you need a repertoire of different time scales. Yeah? You need different layers of time scales, as I like to say. And that's exactly what you see here. So my assumption now, next slide, is these agents do not have time scales. We worked, <coughs> yeah, they do not yet show consciousness because they do not have time scales. They're not temporal in that sense. They don't have temporality. And therefore, they cannot track and link and align to the environmental context. And if you can't do that, you lose consciousness, as I showed in my anesthesia patients and many other data. So you also see I included the yet here. So meaning this is not a principal argument. Because I am very interested in agents with time scales. Why? As a psychiatrist. Because I would like to have these kind of agents with time scales to treat my patients abnormal time scales. Yeah? So that's sort of the idea. That's why I'm very interested in that. <coughs> it still lacks the brain's inner time and time scales that allow for its matching and alignment with the environmental dynamics. That is key. Yeah? And you saw the initial data. I'm completely fascinated by that, that your brain really tracks the rhythm and time scales of your environment. I mean, it's an ingenious evolutionary matching because the brain adapts, but at the same time, it keeps itself stable yeah? by that. It, un it stabilizes it through reaching out to the environmental context. It's like in a relationship. You stabilize yourself through a relationship. Yeah? Same thing. And your brain is much more clever than us and knows how to do that. It's amazing. Yeah? So this is really amazing. And I see the consequences as a psychiatrist on a daily basis, yeah? if that doesn't work. Yeah? So uh, there are huge philosophical implications. I don't want to go long into that. You might have heard about the, what is called the heart problem, um, <coughs> uh, that basically there's a, a gap between brain and consciousness. And I think that gap is no longer there once it's clear. This is a dynamics, uh, time is a common currency, and the same goes for the mind-body problem, which is basically then the problem of how world and brain are related. And with that, I, <coughs> I come to the end of my talk. Uh, I hope that I can at least uh, trigger some thoughts in you and maybe change your thought dynamics a little bit so that you get some other ideas about consciousness, that consciousness is nothing special. It is just a temple feature of how world dynamics and brain dynamics connect with each other. You can see this, this is a textbook which is just about to come out here, a bigger textbook on spatial temporal neuroscience. This is more for broader audiences, neuroways. And thank you very much, and enjoy your consciousness. <laughs>
Thank you very much. Is, is this on? Ah, okay. My question is whether major depression can be diagnosed by EEG. And if yes, is it conducted currently EEG? Is, is EEG testing practiced for, measure, for diagnosing major depression? Okay, so certainly, <coughs> currently there are no EEG-based diagnostic marker for depression. Um, but we're working on that. And it goes into the time what you see in the brain of depression, you see that the brain is literally too slow. You can really measure that the power spectrum is shifted. And that's exactly what the patients also experience. Everything is too slow. Mm -hmm. So we hope that this is sort of a temple marker, which we can measure in EEG, in fMRI, and also on the psychological level. Also, the visual perception is too slow. We showed that. The movements are too slow. So the basic disturbance in depression is probably abnormal slowness. So for me, depression is a speed disorder. So is, is, is there a method of diagnosing of depression through EEG or not yet? As I said, it's, there's no diagnostic marker yet. Okay. We're working on that. Okay, thank you. Because this is really a different approach, very different from what you see otherwise. Okay. The other approach is always focus on cognitive function as a good find. Well, thank you very much for this very interesting talk. Um, I wonder if I may ask, what do you mean by mental? So I think you said something like consciousness is not mental but temporal, if that's Correct. right. And yeah. I wonder what, is, what it is to be mental in your language. And that clearly, it seems to me at least, and correct me if that's wrong, um, is not linked to whatever, let's say, Chalmers would understand by mental, the, the author of this, the hard question of, of consciousness, or it's not what at least philosophers of mind mean by mental. Or if it is, I do. Then, then that would be very helpful how you would explain what mental is and how is it possible that consciousness, just because it's temporal, it cannot also be mental. So. Um, so mentalist, the opposition, of course, is not physical. Yeah, so that's basically the original dichotomy of mental and physical. And then you have all kinds of strategies of linking the two. Reductionism, non-reductionism, parallelism. So mental is defined in a negative way, it's not physical. And then you can associate specific mental properties with it, like Descartes, mental, so-called mental properties. Yeah? And then you can say, okay, I reduce these mental properties to physical properties. That's a strategy of reductionism. I need to go a little bit here into philosophy to answer that question. Or you say, yes, no, I cannot reduce mental properties to physical properties. Then I have a parallelism. That's, for instance, basically what neurophenomenology these days does. And you see my approach is fundamentally different. And that's explicated in the slides. Let me go back. You wanted the philosophy, you get it for free. It's here. This is the key feature. This is the presupposition of the heart problem, of the mind-body problem, of Chalmers, the whole philosophy of mind in the current discussion. I do not share that. Everything is basically that, if you want to speak philosophically, that's a transcendental background assumption. Use the Kantian term here. Yeah? That's the background assumption of current philosophy of mind and current neuroscience. That's basically the floor on which you stand. But I say no. I use a different background assumption. It's this one. Sounds trivial, has major implications. Yeah? And that opens the door for me to say dynamics is the common currency, is shared. That opens the door for me to investigate the dynamics of thoughts. It's completely crazy. 
Yeah, that's the conceptual background for that. And that's why the hard problem is for me, it's, it's not answered, it's dissolved. It's no longer relevant. If you change your background assumption, your problems also change. It's like, oh God, I don't have a good example. Um, yeah, okay, uh, try to surf in Hawaii and try to surf here, uh, on, on the Lake Wan. Yeah? It's a completely different background for the surfing. Same here. So you're exposed to different problems in your surfing in Hawaii and in Lake Wan. You see what I mean? And that's what I'm doing here. So I dig much deeper. Often philosophers of mine don't understand that because they're not aware of their own background assumption of this difference. Do I get a follow-up question, if I may? Um, so the, the difficult question or the hard problem is supposed to come from intentionality or aboutness. So we experience, experience as if our thoughts are about something else. Like my thought that is not you is about you. How can a frequency, whatever it's hertz or whatever, how can it ever be about something else? That's question number one. That's one of the sources of the hard problem. And the second problem, I'm sure you're aware, just to voice it for the class, maybe that would be interesting, is the phenomenal feel. It feels somehow, let's say, to be bored. So if consciousness is purely some kind of frequency, it turns out that if you produce that kind of frequency everywhere, that thing that has that frequency must feel bored. Or so it seems that you're led to believe. And that's, let's face it, that's what leads to Chalmers to talk about the hard problem. And I don't see this answer here. That consciousness can be correlated with some kind of frequency. It's, it's a given. It has been given for a while, and it's stunning so much detail that you have discovered. But I don't think that answers the philosophical problem. And if so I'm making lots of mistakes, I apologize, looking for all the correct answers. Thank you so much. So again, this is a transcendental background assumption. So I, and I explicate that by your first example of intentionality. What is intentionality? Exactly, that's it. it's about something. Now, make a Kantian move here. What does this presuppose? In order for intentionality, my thoughts to be my thoughts to be about something out there. What does this presuppose? A relation. And how is this relation constituted? I showed you an example. I do not deny intentionality. I don't reduce it. You don't. You get me wrong. Reduction is only the possibility, the possible option, con as a conceivability, as philosophers say. Is only here an option, reduction versus non-reduction. The question of non-reduction is nonsensical here. So I do not cash out your intentionality against my frequencies. What I say, I see what does intentionality presuppose. If there were no relation between my inside and my outside, intentionality would remain impossible. Yeah? Otherwise, your thoughts cannot be about something outside the thoughts themselves. So I look for a deeper layer for that what it necessarily presupposes. Yeah? The first my answer to that. The second answer to your feel. You're right. So you misread me because you misread me in terms of reduction or non -re And then you cash out, no, 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 it cannot be just frequency. Uh, you cannot reduce that. But that's the scheme of this one. Reduction is not conceivable in this one. It doesn't raise the question. Read the introduction to my spontaneous brain, 2018 MIT Press. Second, qualitative feel. You're right. I didn't address that. But that's its transformation. So you say, no, 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 it cannot be, and then you cash out a hard problem. I say, no, it's a process of transformation. Give you an example. I'm living in Canada. Water, you know, water is trivial, it's H2O. You know the chemical formula. It transforms from fluid into vapor into ice. Yeah? 
So if we want, and these transformations are dependent upon the environmental context, whether it's hot or warm or whatever. And if you were knowing that all these three states are related to the chemical formula at H2O, you would say uh, it's, it's a different thing. That's exactly what I'm saying. Under certain dynamical context, you have a transformation of your neuronal activity into phenomenal activity, slash what you described by qualitative field. Yeah, I tried to do this first in Unlocking the Brain, Volume 2, Consciousness, 2014. And now we have many more data on that. Yeah, so it's a completely different approach. And that I agree that transformation, I didn't show in detail here. I provided some indirect evidence for that, but I didn't tackle it directly. You're right in that. But you already see here, I use transformation. It's a completely different approach. Yeah, that is based on the similarity. Yeah, and transformation would basically now the actual process. Yeah, if you have this, you would not even come up with transformation because it would not be conceivable. It's not in the options given by your transcendental background or something. Sorry for going too deep into philosophy here, but it's needed. So it's a completely different framework. If you judge it with the criteria of your philosophy of mind, you will not understand this. And you will say that everything what I say is nonsensical and meaningless. Yeah, I know <laughs> I'm going fast. I interpret you. I, I know this. Yeah, it, trust me, it took me many, many years to understand this. Yeah, it really depends, as I said, whether you surf in Lake Van or in Hawaii. It's a complete, you're challenged with different issues in your surfing. Yeah, same thing here. I would like to talk about the recent concept about uh, consciousness that consciousness relies on information. Information is not something static, it's uh, dynamic and uh, in, uh, it's, it, in, in itself creates process. Uh, so could we say that uh, bits of information are connected to consciousness, that everything relies on information. We cannot be conscious without some spec all spectrum of information. Yeah, that's basically the integrated information theory by Tononi, and I know him very well. So I tell you what it is. You say, yes, you're right. No, you're not right. So of course you're right. At this level, you have information. But trust me, your brain produces a lot of rubbish, which is no information at all. A lot of random stuff. Yeah? A lot. I, I'm always amazed, for instance, when I, when I work on grant proposals, uh, which of course nobody likes to do, but including me, but and then at the end you have to shorten it to 10 pages, how much stuff you can take out, how much rubbish and gibberish we include, which is not informational at all. So what I'm targeting here is deep down here, there's complete chaos, there's random, yeah? And the brain structures it. It constructs the information. Yeah? So information is maybe here, at this level, but not here. And I'm interested in this level, because that's the necessary condition of that's the ground upon which your consciousness stands. So I would probably locate Tononi here, yeah? uh, the IIT integrated information theory. Yeah? And you see, for instance, again, mental disorders, schizophrenia, they suffer from insufficient constructing information or wrong information. So you cannot just take information as a given, but your brain constructs it in interaction with the en environment. Yeah? And those processes, how information is constructed, that's what I'm looking for. Yeah? That's down here. Yeah? And that's how your brain does it. Basically, it extracts the information, if you say in quote unquote now, from it extracts dynamic in information from the environment. I can't read it. Uh, yeah, see, you can't even get around it. But it extracts frequency. By that, it constructs information. Yeah? And that's quite amazing. So information presupposes a certain temple structure. And that's the kind of process that I showed you. That's temple structure, your autocorrelation function, your scale-free dynamic. And if that structure is lost, 
or abnormally changed, then you lose information or it becomes abnormal, like in mental disorder. Yeah? I hope I gave you some information. <laughs> So correct me if I'm mistaken, but you said that uh, what differ, what prevents AI from having consciousness is time tracking abilities, right? Time tracking, uh, time scales. Yeah, time scales, which allow for the tracking of time scales in the environment. So my intuition hints me that that uh, idea is wrong, but uh, make me uh, find some proof. Uh, so are you saying that what prevents AI to have consciousness is ability to uh, track, um, track some frequencies around them? Not only that. There is, of course, more also here the whole thought content stuff. Uh, and you need this inner time. You need this con Remember my example of the, uh, of the car on the parking lot, which moves, constantly moves spontaneously. You need this spontaneous activity. Yeah? Um, that enhances your spontaneous pattern and your dynamic range of that. And the larger that is, the higher the likelihood that you correspond and match with something in the environment. Yeah? So everything uh, what I talked about, spine, uh, time scales is also the spontaneous activity, yeah? spontaneous brain activity. Yeah? And that's really very unique. Uh, and the body invests a lot of energy into this spontaneous brain activity. Basically, your, your brain is only 2% of the body weight, uh, but it consumes 20% of all the body's energy. And when you do a certain task, that's just 5% incremental energy increase, your spontaneous activity. So your brain is like, I mean, imagine that you're, tr it's, it's like a little kid. It runs into this direction, it runs into that direction, it goes here, it goes there, it tries out. That's basically what your brain does. Yeah? And then you call it mind, and we call it mind wandering. Yeah? and suddenly you have a new pattern. Yeah, and that range of pattern is very unique. Yeah, that's quite amazing. And that makes it possible that you can track then the frequencies uh, in basically a second or millisecond exact way. Mm. This is an amazing thing for me. Yeah, so it's, uh, and that's an active process. Yeah, so that's the difference. You, could, you can see you can be yes now here for the philosopher, you can be just David Hume and say, okay, this is just a passive thing. It just receives the external input. No, no, no. Your brain actively adapts with its own frequency. It changes its whole power spectrum. Yeah? So that's an active process. It's a very Kantian-like brain. It's not a Humean-like brain. Yeah? That's, that's the interesting thing here. And that is missing in current AI. Yeah? This active, spontaneous component. Yeah? The, also the intra- and intersubject variability. So we are actually, d as I said, I do not principally exclude that. Yeah, you saw the yet, and I read, indeed, I'm trying to work on building time scales into some of the stuff. Yeah, particularly for the machine learning, for getting better prediction of our neuronal data. Yeah, <coughs> if I involve time scales, build in time scales into my machine learning algorithms, then I might get, or in my deep uh, learning uh, networks, then I might get better prediction of my data. Yeah, because the tool with which I try to predict the data includes some feature which is key for the brain and for the behavioral abnormalities I try to predict. Yeah? So don't misunderstand me that I'm blocking here. Yeah. Uh, quick and a short answer. I, I, I hope so. Um, uh, when measuring the, the frequencies of the brain activity, I was wondering what part of the brain was studied. Yeah, good question. Um, 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 <coughs> really depends. If you study sensory processes, visual perception, dynamics of visual perception, of course, you look for the visual cortex. Um, for the thought stuff, that was mainly EEG, where the regions and source localization is usually more difficult. Uh, usually we look at the brain not in terms of regions, but in terms of topography. So topography is a concept which comes from geography. It basically describes the lines. And so you have certain ways of how the different regions stand in relation to each other. 
Yeah, and that's probably key. So let's say if you have the same level of, um, <coughs> let's say, activity in occipital cortex, but you have different activity levels in uh, prefrontal cortex, you will perceive different things. So we consider the brain, we are holist, as we say, or really in a topographic way. And interestingly, the brain has indeed some intrinsically preformed topographic organizations. I showed them, for instance, here, uh, going back to my beloved examples of time scales. Where is this? Okay, it's here. Must be there. Go back. No. Here. You see, for instance, <coughs> as a repertoire of time scales, and you usually see longer, shorter time scales in your sensory cortex, longer time scales in your prefrontal cortex. And that's a gradient. Mm. That can also change. For instance, uh, we showed that if you have certain fast frequency tasks, that difference disappears transiently, but it comes back. Yeah? So intrinsic topographies. That's another thing which is lacking in AI. Yeah? It's an intrinsic topography, which, but it's not written in stone. It's dynamic again. Yeah? So it's certain uh, attractor pattern if you go into uh, dynamic system theory. Yeah? So, and then there's even an intrinsic topography with different layers for your sense of self. It's a set of regions, different layers, each layer different set of regions which are in charge for your interceptive inner body self, outer body self, and for your mental self. Yeah? So it's basically written into your brain's organization between the regions. So you will never get an answer for me, it is this network or that region. I consider this in an overall relative topographical context. So you collected data from different parts and made an average, is that right? Or for every different uh, questions you study different parts? I still no, I, a key answer. I still, for instance, look in depression, I not only look at the prefrontal cortex, but how it relates to the visual cortex. And that relationship predicts the symptoms mm -hmm. and the subjective feeling, mm -hmm. for instance. Yeah? And it's not only the interceptive layer of yourself, the inner body layer of yourself, but it's relative uh, relation to the mental layer. Mm -hmm. That determines your experience. Yeah, so in the same way, I look at all time scales, the relationship between the time scales, which I can measure in the power law exponent scale free experience or autocorrelation. I also look at all regions and look at their relative relationships, and that's the topography. 